Legend of the Snake Sturgeon, which dates to the start of the 1960s, is an example of two of the most formidable influences on not only Morisot's early works, but on his career as an artist. The work was first owned by Susan A. Ross. An artist herself, Ross was a pioneer collector of Morisot's work. The two met while she was sketching in the Beadmore area and continued to correspond by letter in the early 1960s. The letters reveal that Ross not only provided Morisot with artistic supplies, but also that Morisot sent a number of works to Ross in Port Arthur for distribution to buyers at the Lakehead. While we cannot say with certainty, we speculate that this may have been one such work that Ross elected to purchase for her own collection. In his 1989 publication, Dear M, Letters from a Gentleman of Excess, Jack Pollock describes how he was encouraged to meet Morisot by Ross in the summer of 1962. Pollock explains that after his first meeting with Morisot and expressing interest in his works, Ross, quote, drove me to Norvell's the next day. The resultant show in October 1962 has taken on iconic stature. The relationship between Ross and Morisot would wax and wane over the years, but Morisot obviously held his friend in high regard. An eponymous pen and ink portrait of Susan Ross by Morisot is held in the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. Of equal importance is the composition and color of this early work, which shows the clear influence of the traditional Anishinaabe subject matter and style that was encouraged by another of Morisot's friends and mentors, Selwyn Dudeney. In the late 1950s, Dudeney mapped, recorded, and attempted to interpret the painted images found on the Canadian shield. His research included interviewing indigenous, and sometimes non-indigenous, locals to inform on the subjects that were found at the 290 sites in Ontario. One such informant on the oral traditions and shamanism of the Anishinaabe was Norvell Morisot. The two met in 1960 and quickly bonded over a mutual admiration of modern art. Dudeney recognized Morisot's artistic talents and, devoted to promoting Morisot's art to a southern market, encouraged the artist toward a distinctly earthen palette and depictions of his figures in a summary fashion that was akin to the rock paintings. In 1965, Dudeney solicited Morisot to collaborate with him on a book project. In Legends of My People, The Great Ojibwa, from Morisot, as edited by Dudeney, we learn of the fearsome snake sturgeons that inhabited a section of a sacred lake, which is described in the publication as being now under many feet of water due to the hydro dam, alighting with the artist's pencil inscription on the verso of this work. The text describes a big sturgeon with a red belly and a box-shaped head. It was held that, if eaten, one would become a snake or be smothered by them. To what extent we can understand Dudeney's intervention as a dilemma remains a great debate in current discourse. In her 2016 article for the Journal of Canadian Art History, Ruth B. Phillips wrote, In much the same way as Picasso's discovery of ancient Iberian sculpture catalyzed his breakthrough into Cubism, Morisot's access to the bold outlines and flat pictorial spaces of Anishinaabe rock paintings proved the key to his reinvention of the Anishinaabe tradition as a modernist art form. What cannot be contested, however, are the artistic achievements of Morisot at this period, as represented by the present lot. The legend of the snake sturgeon is a visual chorus of incredibly limited color and line. Twelve silhouetted men with glowing eyes are staged in a canoe atop a lake line that thrums in Morisot's warm russet red. Below the water surface lies the fearsome creature, its red belly shown in the X-ray technique that would become Morisot's signature style. In the distance, Morisot establishes his shoreline with deliberately rudimentary details, scant pine trees, and tents, and a small glowing sun that watches over the scene. <laughs> 